We are discovering so much about intermittent fasting, and in today's video, we're gonna cover how intermittent fasting is proving to improve lifespan and longevity. So we're gonna cover a lot of really interesting things. We're gonna talk about adherence, we're gonna talk about why it's easier to stick to, we're gonna talk about the mice studies that we see and why they're actually still relevant, but then we're gonna get into some fascinating stuff like mTOR and even talk a little bit about tumors and stuff like that. Then we're gonna move into PPAR alpha, my favorite protein, some really crazy stuff there. Then as we progress, we're gonna talk about inflammation, we're gonna talk about insulin, and then we're gonna finish up talking about fancy schmancy DNA stuff with telomeres. So some of this science is gonna get a little bit dense, but stick with me through all of it because I promise I'm always gonna bring it home. So let's go ahead and let's jump right in. Please do hit the red subscribe button and then hit the bell icon so you get notifications when I post videos every day. Okay, jumping right into it. We will be referencing a lot of mice studies, okay? But why are mice and animal studies relevant? Okay, here's the thing. Mice studies are important because mice still have 98% of the orthologs that humans do. Okay, that means the generational genes that are passed on are so similar in mice that when it comes down to longevity studies in particular, mice are very, very, very relevant and very safe to look at. With some metabolic studies, maybe not so much, but at least with longevity, this totally makes sense. Now, I will say, there are plenty of human epidemiological studies that reinforce the things we see in animal models. So in some studies, we've seen instances like this. People that are over 50 years old end up having uh, increased risk factors, right? So they're gonna have things like uh, higher fasting glucose, they're gonna have higher blood pressure, they're gonna have higher BMI, and some of them are gonna smoke, right? So what studies have seen is that if we can reverse all four of these risk factors, we can reduce the risk of coronary vascular disease by literally 13x. See? So CVD is gonna reduce by 13x, not 13%, 13x. Well, it turns out that intermittent fasting reverses all of those, with the exception of smoking. It can't reverse someone's bad habit. Okay, point is, it works. Now, let's talk about adherence for a second. The International Journal of Obesity had published a study. They took a look at two groups of people. Okay, groups of people that went on a intermittent energy restriction diet, and a group of people that went on a continuous energy restriction diet. What that means is intermittent fasting versus just general caloric restriction. Well, they found that both groups lost weight, both groups had big improvements in their health, but the intermittent fasting group saw tremendous improvements in their fasting glucose and in their insulin resistance. So that implies that they're going to have better health and better metabolism later on down the line. Also, we found that people that intermittent fast have much higher adherence because they typically can have a little bit more flexibility with their diet because they're eating in consolidated periods of time. Okay, well that's all just justification. Let's talk a little bit more about the interesting science. The first thing I wanna talk about is something called mTOR. Okay, when it comes down to longevity, mTOR is very important. It stands for mammalian target of rapamycin. And the point of mTOR is to grow cells, grow tissue. It is a growth signal, okay? Does that mean that it's bad? Not necessarily. I mean, I will say mTOR is definitely related to a lot of cancer growth, but the point is, is that mTOR needs to be coming at specific periods of time. mTOR gets activated by proteins, okay? Specifically leucine. So if we're consuming food, we're taking in proteins, okay? And these proteins are going to signal mTOR to grow tissue. Now, we don't want that happening continuously. We want that happening in very periodic spurts which is why it doesn't make sense why we used to talk about eating six or eight meals per day. That would mean that we're constantly putting protein in our body to the point where we're constantly stimulating mTOR. Well, again, mTOR is not bad. We need cellular growth and we need cellular repair, but when it's too much and we don't have a balance of being able to clean it up, that's when we run into a problem. And you may have heard of the important word autophagy before. Well, autophagy is in essence the opposite of mTOR, right? So whenever we eat, we spike mTOR which is the opposite of autophagy. We grow cellular tissue. Well, when we fast, we have autophagy that upregulates, and that comes in and that cleans up. So it's always a checks and balances of mTOR and autophagy. Growth, cleanup, growth, cleanup. So you can kind of see where I'm going with this. If we have a high level of mTOR all the time, that can be associated with a shorter lifespan. We've also seen that specific kinds of mTOR, in this case, mTOR C1, that increases what's called tumorigenesis, just like the name implies, tumorigenesis grows tumors. Well, this process of tumorigenesis by itself, outside of growing tumors or cancer, actually suppresses autophagy in and of itself. What that means to you is that if you are consistently eating and you're not giving yourself a break by doing some fasting now and then, you can actually suppress the autophagic flux within your body that allows you to clean up in the first place. So point is, take a break from eating. 
Now I want to move into my favorite protein of all time, my favorite thing, PPAR alpha. This is fascinating stuff. So PPAR alpha is something that is activated when fatty acids are liberated into our bloodstream from our stored tissue. So what that means is when you have fat on your body and your body releases that fat into the bloodstream to ultimately be used as fuel, we activate PPAR alpha. Now we're starting to see that whenever there is PPAR alpha signaling, we have ultimately better health and an improvement in lifespan. Now, we can connect the dots all we want, but the point is when someone becomes more fat adapted off of utilizing their own fat, it signals a cascade of different processes, including genetic processes and gene transcription that could make us live for a longer period of time. Now, there's other pieces of the equation too, PPAR also activates what's called ketogenesis. And before you turn off this video because you think I'm gonna go down a keto rabbit hole, let me tell you I'm not. When you're fasting, your body produces ketones and it's one of the goals, right? When you go through a period of time without eating, sure, you've got all these benefits from abstaining from food, but one of the benefits as an addition is that your liver produces ketones as a fuel source. So PPAR, when your body is liberating fats from your tissues, actually ends up signaling the liver to produce more ketones, which have healing properties. We'll talk about that in a minute. But I have to say the most important thing out of all of this with PPAR is when we look at animal models, we look at different models, in specific worm models, we find that PPAR signaling directly correlates with an increase in lifespan, indicating that that when someone is fat adapted, or an individual or a model is fat adapted, they will live for a longer period of time. Well, how do we translate that into a human study so that you can feel very comfortable that fasting really is going to potentially, at least, increase lifespan? So when we look at centenarians, these are people that are over 100 years old, they find that they have larger lipoproteins, higher amounts of HDL cholesterol, but then also more gene transcription, more gene activation, for uh, things that move triglycerides, so the genes that are involved in the transportation of triglycerides. What that means in a very simple way is the people that are living to be over 100 years old and have good lifespans are all fat adapted. They have high amounts of lipids in their blood and their bodies are clearly showing the signs of utilizing fats. And they have that upregulation of PPAR alpha because their bodies are using those fats. That's wild stuff. So when we cross-reference the studies, we see, holy moly, this PPAR alpha thing when our body actually gets to the point of using its own fat, that is a proven concept with some strong correlation and even potential causation for just overall longevity. It's fascinating. Now, let's go ahead and let's talk a little bit about ketones for a minute. And again, this isn't a ketogenic like push. I'm not trying to go that route. We have to remember that ketones, when we fast, ultimately have a very powerful effect on the body, okay? So, the main thing I want to talk about is what is called a histone deacetylase inhibitor. Okay, ketones inhibit histone deacetylase. Now, that's complicated. What the heck am I talking about? What that means is that our DNA, okay, our DNA is under lock and key. It's got a brick wall built around it, okay, and it is histone deacetylase that is basically building this wall. It turns out that ketones inhibit histone deacetylase. So it means that ketones stop the building of the wall, which means that our DNA is able to get expressed. It means that our DNA is actually able to do what it's supposed to do so that we can live and grow to our full, quite literally, genetic potential. What does this have to do with lifespan? In virtually all models, histone deacetylase inhibition has been linked to an increase in lifespan. Why? because your DNA is an under lock and key and your DNA can actually do its job. That means cells that maybe wouldn't even get built before would actually get built. Okay. Now, how does this happen? Well, researchers are still trying to figure it out, but a lot of it seems to point to what is called FOXO3, FOXO3. Okay. Now, FOXO3 is a powerful antioxidant at the genetic level, but it also helps DNA clean up. So if we can inhibit histone deacetylase, we can potentially activate more FOXO3, which basically just makes our whole genetic process and cleanup that much more efficient. Now, I know some of you that are watching this video might be concerned with like cardiovascular disease and things like that. So I want to throw one thing out there. Okay, ketones have been shown, beta-hydroxybutyrate, the main ketone body, like that you see when you fast, has been shown to improve vasculature. So it improves the overall health of your cell walls and it improves the health of your overall vasculature. So therefore, you have less perfusion, you have more in the way of actual just structural integrity to your arteries and to your veins and to your vascular system. 
I'm going to take a quick moment here to say that if you are practicing intermittent fasting and you're looking at doing it or you're looking at doing the ketogenic diet, uh, please take a moment after this video to check out Thrive Market down below in the description. So in addition to being a big supporter of this channel, I've been able to create specific fasting boxes, specific keto boxes, specific hormone optimization boxes. And what I mean by that is grocery boxes. So uh, I go to Thrive Market, it's an online membership-based grocery store. I pick the groceries that I would assemble in a given box and then I make it so that my viewer base has it available to them. So it makes it really cool. It's like you're able to go grocery shopping with me and able to like show you what's going to work well for you. So hopefully I'm earning some of your trust with this video by explaining some of this stuff and you can lean on me a little bit for the right food. So check them out down below. Honestly, it ends up being cheaper than the grocery store and it gets delivered right to your doorstep. And a big thank you to them for extending those discounts out to everybody and making everything just available for people that watch my videos. All right, on that note, we need to talk about insulin for a minute. Insulin is seeming to be the big issue overall with a lot of chronic disease, but it also has a big issue with our lifespan. Okay? It's correlated with that. We have seen time and time again that insulin resistance leads to type 2 diabetes, leads to all these other issues, leads to essentially premature like, cell death, right? It's bad. It's hard on the body. If we can reverse that or we can reduce how much we're eating and how frequently we're eating, we allow our insulin resistance to improve and our insulin sensitivity to go up. Again, in centenarians, people that are over 100 years old, we've seen that they have an increase in insulin sensitivity compared to other people. That means that there is a direct correlation. Of course, it doesn't mean causation, but come on, it's pretty evident that if you are more insulin sensitive, which also goes along with being fat adapted, you could probably live for a longer period of time. It's pretty interesting and the science is right there. It simply comes down to the fact that you're not giving your body a chance to clean up when you're constantly spiking insulin. Insulin activates mTOR and mTOR blunts autophagy. If you're constantly spiking insulin, the janitorial crew never gets a chance to come in. So think of it like this. You have a dirty office, but you have a lot of employees and you have a lot of people coming into that office, but you have no janitorial crew, but more people keep coming in your office. Well, what's gonna happen to your office? It's gonna get trashed. It doesn't matter how clean the body is operating or the office is operating. More people means more waste, okay? More activity means more waste with no janitorial crew. The office never closes down. The janitorial crew never has a chance to come in. Imagine that happening inside your body. Now in model organisms with a novel decrease in insulin resistance, we saw an increase in lifespan up to 300%. Does that mean you're gonna live to 300 years old? No, it doesn't mean that at all, but it means in specific models, we definitely see that as soon as insulin resistance improves and insulin levels go down, we see a big increase in lifespan. Anyhow, I digress. Now let's move into inflammation because this is such an important, important piece of everything when it comes down to the pillars of health. Inflammation is just that low grade, just, fight that your body's always having to battle, right? It's like your immune system's overactive. And there's two things I want to focus on. Fasting gives your gut a break, which means that your gut inflammation will go down. Okay. And that has been proven in studies too. So when your gut inflammation goes down, what happens? Well, it means that you have less particles that get from your gut into the bloodstream, triggering inflammation systemically. Fasting allows the gut to heal improves gut motility, things move through the gut faster. The gut lining can actually heal. It improves the gut mucosal layer with time. It protects your body from the lipopolysaccharides that are on the outside of the gram-negative bacteria within our gut. Okay, we do not want that stuff leaching into the bloodstream. It triggers inflammation, which is a root of just about every chronic disease, and of course can be related to insulin, mind you. The other piece of the equation here, outside of just the gut inflammation that gets reduced, is going to be the production of ketones once again. Ketones, beta-hydroxybutyrate, just in itself, is a powerful anti-inflammatory. It has effects directly and indirectly on the inflammatory system, mainly reducing what is called nuclear factor kappa B. And I know I'm getting dense here, and I can talk about it in other videos for those of you that don't wanna hear all of it. Point is, modulation of inflammation is key. So let's roll into the final piece, which I hope you're still with me here, because this is really cool stuff. The world of telomeres. You probably have heard at least briefly of telomeres before. Tel telomeres are repetitive strands of DNA that sit at the end of chromosomes. And whenever we go through gene expression, whenever we're activating our genes and we're doing this stuff, we end up having uh, a little bit of a shortening of those telomeres. And as those shortened telomeres get shorter and shorter and shorter, we expose our DNA to a lot more damage. Meaning when our genes do express and we do go through this transition, we run the risk of a lot of mutation. 
gene mutation that triggers abnormal growth or dysfunctional cells that don't really work properly, that end up just dying, right? This is a bad thing, and that is directly tied in with aging. So as we get older, our telomeres get shorter, and we have less efficiency in replicating cells and doing what we need to do. Well, it turns out that a lot of this can be mitigated through an enzyme known as telomerase. Well, it just so happens that fasting improves telomerase activity, as been shown in specific models within gut stem cells. So in the journal Cell Stem Cell, it was found that fasting activates fatty acid oxidation that has an effect on increase in telomerase activity. You see what the common theme here is, though? Just one more time, see if you can connect the dots. What did I say? Fatty acid oxidation. What does that mean? PPAR alpha. Remember what I talked about? It turns out that when we're liberating fats from our tissue into our blood, it activates telomerase activity that also ends up protecting our telomeres, protects our DNA. So I rest my case. There's lots of evidence on fasting on longevity. Okay. Whether you are using fasting to lose weight, to get cognitive performance, or to just get healthier, it is the way to go. Whether you combine it with veganism, ketosis, vegetarian, paleo, carnivore, I don't care. It's the time-restricted eating that does the magic. As always, keep it locked in here on my channel, and I'll see you soon.